Thank you so much, Aicha. Um, I'm a proud YGA alumni, and it's great to be here with you today. At YGA, uh, one of the things we really emphasize is the importance of the people you meet and to keep the ones close to you that share your values and vision. So I feel incredibly fortunate to, ha to have met our next speaker, Daniel Dole Steinberg, and to have the opportunity to work with him in London and with his co-founder, Eric van der Klee, as they build the Eden-based ecosystem to support tech companies toward creating a better future. Thank you so much for being with us here today and making the time for us. Thank you, Gokche. It's very nice. And could I just say you are building this great thing with us and uh, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So, uh, Daniel, one of the reasons we wanted to have this discussion with you is because you have this impressive uh, long background in disruptive technology and you had various roles as a founder of companies, as an advisor to the UK government and the European Commission on Innovation, Growth, Education Policy. So I'd like to start off uh, by first talking about that a little bit. Can you tell us about that journey and your vision? Thank you, yes. So um, I'm, I was born in the UK. I went to a very good British public school that uh, I excelled at sports, but not so well at academics. Um, and I went to university studying electronic engineering, um, <clears throat> which I uh, got through. I ended up uh, working in the financial center of the UK in, in the city of London, building the very early derivative trading technologies back in the early 90s when they were very, very disruptive and very new for the city. And, you know, if you look at where they've come now, they're thousands of times bigger than the original financial. Um, systems that we had then and it was a really interesting for me to be able to to see how these were you know modifying the way that finance could be operated and in the early stages they had phenomenal benefits for the people that use them um, i ended up in new york um, again because of my derivative trading uh, technology experience but i uh, quickly fell into a role that was preventing one of the biggest banks in the world being shut down by the banking committee. And uh, I was quite a young guy. Um, and my role was really to uh, re-engineer them um, process-wise um, or, or guide them to, a, to, to change their processes. And this was a two-year role I had. And it made me realize how difficult change is, actually, even when people's jobs depend on it and the, 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 the entity that you're working for depends on it. it it's really difficult to get people to, to change. Um, I came back to the UK in the late 90s and founded a company that disrupted the way that uh, the software companies and then the gaming companies and entertainment companies manage their IP and it became a very big global uh, product. Um, so that gave me a lot of experience again in you know how you get change how you 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 move people towards change and whilst doing that i uh, got involved in the uh, ip debate within the european uh, parliament uh, when they were deciding whether protecting ip should be allowed or should not be allowed uh, including patents etc and um, in in those days i really said yes to every everything and um, i ended up in Brussels, um, one of the sort of figureheads of the pro IP debate. And that led me quite quickly to being appointed by the European Commission to advise the commissioners. Um, as it was an honorary, it was an honorary role, no pay, etc, which allowed me to be, um, you know, uh, unbiased um, to to advise them on innovation, growth, disruption, future of work I got very interested in even education I started learning a lot about education about the education systems these are the type of things um, we did we were revising them on and they did that for five years um, and during that time uh, it, the financial crash happened I, I helped uh, the British go French governments and the European Commission in the, the the fallout from the financial crisis and the rebuilding of that and then uh, 
dealt with the UK on how they deal with the EU. It was very interesting to actually be inside it, you know, as a as an inside member, um, being able to advise them. I was very very passionate about making the EU the best place it could be for Britain. Um, not 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 because uh, of Britain, but because I felt that a, a good EU at the time would be good for Britain and good for the EU itself. Um, I then ended up writing the 2012 innovation report for the British government. Um, so I actually spanned um, three three different political parties: the Lib Dems, the uh, Conservatives, and Labour. Um, and then. Um, started uh, co-founding and investing in a lot of startups which really led me to, to to where i am today and understanding you know what startups need you know the the trials and tribulations and in 2016 i learned about the blockchain and just realized that or, or felt that this was an enormous potential for changing the future not because of the blockchain itself but because what it enabled with other um, technologies that were being built around it and uh, created a, a well-known token project called the Atari token. I was the first co-founder of that project, which was a metaverse future of work project back in 2017. Um, and that sort of really leads me to where we, where we are today, which is, you know, oh, you know, having been a disruption for a long time, having uh, founded startups, invested in startups um, in a lot of disciplines and a lot of areas, but also seeing from the corporate side how difficult it is to enact change. You know, the, the Eden-based model is really about enabling startups to take advantage of disruptive technologies to disrupt through innovation. So what you have with disruption is a very random um, impact you know you don't know where it's going to come from you don't know exactly what it's going to do in fact one of the, the big areas of the eu when i was there was the unintended consequence you know of, of policy making and you know there's unintended consequences of all change so the the model that we that we do and, and you know go to you're very familiar with it but the the model we do is we try and find companies that really innovate with very strong teams and we encourage them to see a disruptive future but through an innovative step so that they can take their customers they can take their their teams they can take everybody through that process um and we and we and we do that by combining um our skill sets um, we're a community we sometimes call ourselves a tribe you know it's community is very important um to to reimagine how these people op these companies operate but also provide an environment in which they can operate um, effectively yeah, um, thank you so much for sharing <clears throat> all of your journey, Daniel. And it, like I couldn't help but notice that every time you mentioned disruptive, you also mentioned the change and the struggle with change. And I think it's really important. And I love what we're building here at Eden Based Ecosystem because you really emphasize community and having um, bringing our skill sets together to work toward a vision where we supercharge technology companies, startups. Uh, to create a better better future and we we really believe in the power of community at Eden base too and on, with that I kind of want to like switch gears a little bit because as we were building this well we got to work together but you also met quite a few YJ alumni um, like Shahin and Utku who participated um, in our Eden base startup competition who did really well moved into our hub we met with Mina, founder of UpSchool. We have a partnership with UpSchool. She did sessions for our um, startup competition companies. And you're familiar with some of the YGA startups like UpSchool, Twin Science, WeWalk. And I wanted to ask you, what are your impressions of the YGA alumni that you've met and the YGA startups? Well, actually, I see, you know, as I think about this, you know, I see a lot of uh, similarities between YGA and what Edenbase is trying, are trying to do, you know. We have a lot of experience in what we're doing. We like, you know, some of us are role models to other people. We're, we're also giving back. And that's enabling, you know, one of the things when 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 Eric joined, uh, you know, as the second founder and I, you know, encouraged him that this was something we should be doing with our lives. It was, you know, we have a limited amount of time, you know, but but if we use that time to do one thing, then we can only do one thing. But if we work with a community of people, then we can do great, much, much more. And I see that it's all, it's all about, you know, capitalism and, uh, and giving back altruism and competitiveness are so important together. And there is a really a real, real synergy between the community that you 
have already created and the, the synergy that, and the community that we are creating at the moment. You know, these are multiplier effects, you know, um, the, the ability of, you know, as you say, I've met some, uh, some of your alumni, I've met some of the people there, uh, I've seen some of the companies coming out of it. And, and it does seem to be a very nice balance of altruism and competitiveness. And, you know, there's a really interesting thing about altruism and competitiveness. You know, Charles Darwin could not understand why the altruism gene still exists. It should not exist because people that are altruistic don't, you know, would sacrifice themselves for the, for the, for the community. So the competitive ones survive. But they, you know, they discovered after he died that actually communities and tribes, if you want to go back to that, that element, work well with where there are altruists and competitiveness together rather than just purely competitive. And I think that's why this is what you're doing is so important. You know, it's the, it's the shared mission, it's the ecosystem, it's the people with different skills. And finally, the thing that we really believe in here, it's the, the real Eric piece of, um, I mean, Eric's got many talents, but, but the real thing that, 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 that I hook on with what he's developed is this orchestrated serendipity. You know, the network effect of people is the same as the network effect of a social network or, or a computer system or whatever. Everybody you add, every skill set that you add multiplies. It doesn't go linearly. And that means that by if you can get, find a way, which you seem to be successfully doing, of allowing people to meet and engage and be open to challenge. You know, this is really important. We, we have this thing here. We talk about, you know, ESG. What is ESG? And, you know, I can be very contrarian um, in my views, often um, often to challenge people. But but you know, ESG to me is about allowing people to challenge the way that you're moving forward. And we should be open to respectful challenge about what we're doing. We're we doing we're doing the right thing rather than tick boxing. And I do think that you, from what I've seen from you, you, you seem to to have that. Uh, as well, I, I say as well, you know, we're, we're even base is new, you're, you're, you're way, you've done it already, but it's, uh, I believe in that very strongly. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's really great that when you mention altruism and competitiveness, it's really similar to the YGS double winked because like altruism is the selfless concern for others and competitiveness, you need that to get better. Like you can't just like have one without the other. And at YGA, we also have the double wink of like conscientiousness and competence. So I think maybe that might have been one of the things that 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 kind of like attracted me to Eden Base because all of these values that I learned at YGA felt like it, it, it found another like purpose, uh, another place to be useful. And I remember that whenever I introduce you to someone and you ask me where, how do you know them, and I say YGA, and you're like, is this like a really small like country and I say no it's like when you find the people who share your values and vision you just like stick to them and um, you find ways to like keep collaborating with them and that's why I think it's like there's like a really good synergy between Eden Base and YGA and um, and I think it aligns with the Eden Base missions as well I mean I, the I just would like to working on yeah sorry I'd just like to extend that it's not just finding people that um share your visions because they naturally find those but that you can guide people to find those you know you know what you're doing as well is you know we have a print we're working on apprentice schemes we're working on making sure like today we had people in that were from university we were talking to them about what we do and how we do it you know from even you know things like even i, I say it, you know because it's not the area that i focus on but even the brand how we came up with a brand that matches what we're doing and, and it was really nice to watch that process of how we came to that and how it was you guided us to come to that and that's important too so we're bringing these people in we're giving them a lot of experience and actually you know someone came up to us afterwards and said you know can we you know, i'd like to engage with you he was a student you know another one is very motivated and and what you're doing is you're explaining to them how the world with your with your experience and what you've done how how it can be better this way than other ways and actually you can make them see that in themselves so i think there's there's that as well and i i think that's probably more important especially with what's going on today with the the rise of technology um the rise of globalization and the 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 the, the structural issues that we have in the world and i think that if we, if we can engender the the generation that's coming up through 
particularly what you're doing, you know, the, the very wide reach that you've got. If you can engender that spirit and um, belief in those people, I think that's incredible. So I'm glad that you have uh, brought up uh, technology and the rise of technology because I kind of want to have a discussion about that too. Um, the Eden base the, at the core of our model is finding companies and supercharging them with frontier or emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, quantum computing. And you have a vision for this. You wrote a, a book that's soon uh, going to be published uh, about the rise of technology and the role of these technologies and the importance of integrating these technologies and understanding them like AI and blockchain, quantum computing. Could you share um, your views on, your thoughts on the rise and role of these technologies? Well, you know, technology is neither, neither good or, nor bad. You know, that's, that's the first thing. You know, it's very important to say these are projects, products that we're developing that get used. Um, you know, I think that's really, really key. And once we understand that we're building these sort of things, we have to then worry about how we're building them. And one of the things that always um, I find so amazing is how quickly we adapt to change and it becomes normal. I mean, I was talking yesterday, I was at an event yesterday, an AI event where they were all, you know, head of shell of AI, you know, one of the biggest AI companies in the UK, the, the CEO was there, you know, the head of the UK AI, government's AI, etc. And I was saying to them, you know, we all carry our mobile phone. We were all in our sort of slightly later age. So, and I said, you know, you can't even remember 2010 when these didn't exist really. You know, we've just become completely um, integrated with these technologies. So I think that's, that's, that's a really important part of it. But there are benefits and dangers of these, therefore, because of the way that they are built and the, the way they are deployed. So that's also key. The other thing that we have to remember, and I think people do forget this when they, when they do worry about this. You know, the, the last decade was the best decade for humanity ever. You know, there was the least child mortality. There was the least famines. There were the there were the the, the 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 average income of the world rose. That doesn't mean that people aren't being left out, but but on the whole, these technologies are delivering enormous benefits. And I, you know, there is no doubt that these technologies have the potential to solve the problems that we still have in the world. You know, uh, climate change. You know, uh, hunger. Um, dictatorships etc they do have that ability so we we need to guide them in a way that creates that future and and you know you mentioned my book my book is i i try and map where humans have come or people have come since the industrial revolution i use 1780 as that which is where it came out of the uk and and what's that done to us i also try and look at where computers have come in the last 50 years and i try to understand what the outcomes could be for these as we combine now you, you know people talk about industrial revolution four which i don't like that moniker because it makes it assume it's an extension of what we've been through and i don't think it is this is more of a cognitive revolution this is taking away our brain powers and there are a lot of examples of that and because we're blind to it because it becomes so obvious we don't even realize that that's what's going on so what we're you know, apart from the fact that at Eden Base we are, we have this thesis about which we've discussed this innovation to disrupt thesis and how we choose people that are great um, to do that. We also have this: what is the future? So, out of the book, you, we built a mind map. You know, Eden Base has a mind map of where we see these technologies going. What what are the outcomes we would like to see? And it's a living document; it will change. And as we make progress, we should be addressing it along that mind map. We should also be building this community together, as I said, you know, that, that allows challenge. We should be bringing the, the, the people that we had in today, the universities, Eric and I have government links they should be in. You know, we, should, we want uh, a mix of everybody involved to understand what these are, what these are doing. Because as these technologies deliver benefits, they also deliver negative so for instance if we look at the lockdowns in the western world they're only possible because of technology you know had they, had it been 20 years ago there is no way the the west could have locked down so that's a great benefit because it stopped the disease but it also has disadvantages because of the damage it's done to some people that were locked down so so they you've got to be very careful about these things these technologies are providing productivity gains and therefore in the real world 
we have to take them. If your competitor or a company starts having massive productivity gains over you, if let's say uh, a legal firm, instead of needing 100 people, needs only 20 because the technology is doing the work of 80, and your competitor is part, has 20 people, you can't have 100 anymore. You know, you have to do that, which means the, the offset of that is you've got 80 people that, that need a role. So the the opportunities for that are either to create a society in which those type those people can do something that they don't need an, a, 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 a traditional income, or we find something else. So one of the things that really I find amazing about these things is how these these things always happen. You know, they, there's always a balance. So I love that you know the productivity gains are enormous, but at the same time these technologies have allowed the rise of the metaverse and. And the metaverse that I look at, I mean, there are two metaverses. There's the Zoom type metaverse, the Facebook type metaverse. But the other one is the gaming metaverse, you know, what's coming out of the Fortnite, you know, the, the future extensions of those. Now, those give enormous opportunities for people. The, the project I built before the Atari token was all about enabling work in the metaverse. And the, the numbers are staggering. I mean, we, the estimate was $16 trillion a year of economy in the metaverse as it is today forgetting what the future holds if we could just build that metaverse now that's the size of a chinese economy so so if we if we if we um manage these technologies correctly and we all have to care this is the you know my final point on this um, it, it would be the swarm effect you know a lot of people doing small things is far greater than one something so we when we use these technologies we have an obligation to to be considering what we're what we're delivering you know i i had a very cool piece of tech yesterday i mean it seems obvious but i've never heard of it that, that, that a few people installed in the ai which which just google searches every few seconds just random google searches so google can't understand about them anymore and you know, the benefits of Google and the disadvantages. If I go onto Google, it knows what I like. And therefore, if I search for something, it gives me something that's relevant. But there are some downsides of it. So each of us, I think, have a, have a, have a, a role to play. And if my book, um, if we're moving away from Eden Base for, for a minute for that answer, in my book, my, my, my message to people is these technologies can be a great benefit. They can be a great danger. Each and every one of us has a part to play because my view even though you and I work together every day, Gigi, your, your view on life and my view on life are different. So if I build a technology, it's likely not to suit yours. And, and if we go one step removed from that, it's going to be very different. If we get two steps removed, the, the desires are, are very different. So it's up to the world to, to understand what it wants from these technologies, not single individuals. Well, I mean, thank you so much for sharing that vision. And I re really appreciate it. Like what you talk about, the swarm effect is very similar to what we say at YJ. Um, what Mar Margaret Mead said, actually, like never doubt the small group of people can change the world, and they, like that's all, all that ever has. And with that, in our last minute, I just want to ask you, like, with your vision and background in tech, and you know, like being at this very unique position of like having an experience in disruptive technology and a vision and insight in this. Uh, what would you suggest to high school university students who are looking for a career in technology making an impact um, as your last takeaway from our conversation? Well, I, I, I would guess two things. Um, the first is look to the future, don't look to the past. So very quickly, my, my father um, and my father-in-law, both single parent, uh, single, uh, single child from single parents, um, you know, one parent families, um, one left school at 15 and became incredibly successful, uh, very creative, very, very successful. The other got a double first uh, scholarship to Cambridge, double first, also had the same traje high trajectory. So it's the future, not the past. Um, the other thing is, um, remember, you, you need to be lucky in life and luck is probably the most important skill. And, you know, there's been research done on luck, and there are actually four factors of luck. The first is that you meet lots of people. Second is that you cannot believe in a world in which you don't succeed. The third is that if something bad happens to you, 
you um, see the positive in it. And the fourth is that you can be intuitive. Now, the first three you can change really quickly. And so that's what I would encourage people to do. I, you know, YGA is really good for that. There are people around you. They can, you, you can meet a lot of people. You can incept ideas. You can spark ideas. And on the, you can also um, tune those two. On the, on the intuitive one, you know, if you practice it, um, you know, I find that a more difficult one to handle because I, you know, it's more difficult for me. But there are people that can that really can train you in that. So I guess I would leave you with that. You know, the future is positive. You can make a difference. You will make a difference if you believe in it. And just being part of this community by talking to those other people. If you're at the role model stage, giving great advice. Role models are so important in this space. And if you're at the other end, just go out and meet people and be open to ideas. And then finally, when you're young, say yes to everything. And as you get older, say more no's, but always be open to, to ideas. Yeah. You know, Don't just say no immediately, um, like oh. I sometimes do, and then think about it afterwards <laughs> and say yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you so much. I, you did the recap uh, for me too, because I was gonna say like, yeah, that, this is definitely um, the future is bright and we have to be responsible of frontier technologies and paying attention to it. And it's great to have you with us, Daniel, and looking forward to finding more synergies between Edenbase companies, uh, alumni and uh, YGA companies, alumni and Edenbase. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening to us. Thank you, Gautier.